Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, let's continue on from where we left off in chapter six, uh, answering to common questions on sicknesses and healing. Uh, we looked at uh, Paul's thorn. Um, as we, we looked at the passage that talks about, uh, I didn't look at Paul's thorn. Okay, uh, so we looked at that passage. Uh, let's uh, look at another uh, a frequently asked a question or a story that is uh, misunderstood or uh, misinterpreted uh, is the story of Job, right? Job's uh, troubles, um, right? His life is often explained, uh, is taken into a, a, and you know spoken of as an example, saying, "Okay, you know, he went through this, so we also have to go through everything what Paul, uh, you know, Job went through, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Okay, so we'll read a few scriptures and we'll try and understand. Okay, so Job chapter 1 verse 12, uh, it says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Uh, Job 2 verse 6 and 7, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Okay, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job. Who struck Job? Satan. Okay, um, Job chapter 2 verse 10. Uh, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Uh, more scriptures. Job 3.25 says, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me okay right and so uh we know the story of job and all of that has happened you know uh what he feared has happened uh what he dreaded has happened to job he did not want any of this thing he was afraid that might happen to him and so it happened but then look at job chapter 42 the last chapter job chapter 42 verse 10 it says and the lord restored job's losses when he prayed uh, for his friends. Um, indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Okay, uh, one of the points that I want to make here in his story uh, is right, there, there are 42 chapters. Uh, now, some people think, okay, it must have lasted for 42 years or something like that. No. Um, approximately, the uh, scholars, biblical scholars, and the historians claims that. The span of Job's troubles, his sorrow, his pain, and everything was approximately more or less within a year, within one year, not 42 years, because it has 42 chapters. Okay, um, so that's a side note. Uh, let's look at James chapter 5, verse 11. Uh, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job. And seeing the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Okay, uh, so how do we look at this uh, scriptures, this story? Right, we very clearly see in James chapter and uh, Job chapter two, uh, verse seven. It says, "So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils." So it was Satan who struck Job and his family causing uh, you know all these calamities and losses and sicknesses etc etc all right it was Satan who struck we cannot blame God for the things that Satan did we cannot okay we got to stop doing that we need to start teaching people to stop doing that we cannot blame God for the things that Satan did Right, sure, yeah, it is true that God did give grant permission for Satan to touch Job, right? Uh, right, who was and who was otherwise under the divine protection, right? Uh, and so it and 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 what happened to Job happens to us today as well, right? In our world today, the, the Satan, the demonic powers, are permitted to a certain for a certain period of time. Right to do their uh, to do to do their evil works, they're permitted. Right, uh, God does not stop the devil uh, or the demons from coming against a believer. 
like you, you know like us uh, with temptations or hindrances or obstacles or hardships etc etc right all of us face these kinds of things uh, god permits these things uh, to go on even against those who believe in him and but the point is he also uses these as part of our training uh, to mature uh, into becoming more christ likeness right uh, and that's why there is this invitation for us to fight the good fight to resist the devil and and all of this right it says uh, wrestle against the powers of darkness you have uh, you know we've been given these scriptures uh, psalm 91 psalm uh, 34 etc um, to use as weapons right in Ephesians chapter 6 uh, and the Bible is very clear when it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood uh, right against the principalities and and we see that he's he's the prince of the air uh, we, we read that about in the book of Ephesians right and so the point here is that the devil will do what he knows to do best and that is bring against all, all these uh, hardships, difficulties, um, and sorrows, and whatnot. But attributing what the devil does to God is uh, is not the right thing to do, if I have to say it in a very nice way. Um, okay. Um, and so the thing that we can learn from his story, of the story of Job, is what we have to remember, guys, is uh, the story of Job, or Job itself, uh, right? It's chronologically older than the book of Genesis, right? Uh, and we have to remember that Job did not have the scriptures like you and I have. He did not have the Bible like you and I have, right? He did not have Psalm 91 to read and be assured, uh, to be encouraged and whatnot. Job did not have any of these things, right? But with what little faith and what he knew about God, in that he persevered, he endured. And how much more should we, with all you know, all the Bibles and different translations and versions that we have, um, you know, should and can endure, right? And so, this endurance of Job is what we are called to emulate, right? Knowing that the Lord is indeed compassionate, He is merciful. He will eventually turn things for our good, right? Uh, another aspect, would you? Uh, if you noticed in Job chapter 3, verse 25, is that he says, and for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. Um, that's one aspect where it talks about fear. Fear is faith in, in the opposite direction, in the wrong direction, in other words, right? Fear is faith in the wrong direction. It, it attracts wrong things in our lives, the fear. And as the children of God, we can, uh, we are called uh, to live a life of faith, to rest um, in His promises and in His faith. Okay, and that is the story of Job, uh, where we have to be absolutely certain that it was Satan who struck. We cannot attribute what Satan did to God. And when we go through hardships because uh, our struggles uh, and losses and everything that the Satan, uh, that the devil brings, uh, we are encouraged to persevere and endure. Okay, uh, the weapons, uh, ha uh, you know, have been given to us. Like his word is with us. We declare uh, his scriptures of faith over our lives and continue to walk this walk of uh, of, of faith. Okay. Uh, another frequently asked question uh, is what does it mean when it says delivering one to Satan? Okay, delivering one to Satan or handed them over uh, to the devil. Um, so we read that in, okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. It says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you for i indeed as absent in body but present in spirit have already judged as though i were present him who has so done this deed so in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, where you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such 
a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of Lord Jesus. Okay, another instant is book of Timothy chapter 1 verse 20 of two other individuals. It says, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I deliver to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Okay, it talks about the, these individuals uh, in, 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 in the book of Timothy, chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. It says, and their message was spread like can will spread like cancer. Talking about the same individuals, Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. Now, okay, so what, are we, what is Paul talking about uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, is 1 to 5? Uh, who is he talking about? Now, you know, it, it starts off by saying that sexual immorality among you has been reported uh, and things that are happening are not even named among the Gentiles. So Paul is aware of these things and he rebukes this individual who is committing such immorality. Right, he is uh, administering his apostolic authority that has been that is over him, and so he's disciplining a certain individual. Now, what we have to keep in mind when we read these statements or these words or these lines that says handed them over to Satan is uh, now we've all seen some episodes of uh, in a court scene, right, in a court of law where a judge uh, makes a decision, right? So there's this uh, a perpetrator in that, uh, in that stand, right? Um, and then uh, he's been uh, accused of being guilty of murder or whatnot, right? The judge is sitting and he said, okay, you're guilty of this. And now I hand you over to the authorities, right? To the police or the cops, you know, you know who will take um, the further actions. Are you with me? If we see that God is a righteous God, He's a just God. And so what He's saying is, okay, now I've made this decision, you are so and so, now I hand you over to the authorities. That's basically what it what what means here. Right? Okay, you've been found guilty, I'm handing you over, and that's what is happening here. And and what Paul is saying is that okay, this person who is committing this sexual immorality uh, has to be removed. We're handing him over until he repents. And now we actually see that in Second Corinthians, uh, he says, "Okay, hey, uh, you know this person who was punished, uh, if he's repented and whatnot, that is sufficient." You should actually read Second Corinthians chapter two, verse six to eight. It says, "This punishment." which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary you ought to rather to forgive and comfort him lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow therefore i urge you to reaffirm your love to him so he's talking about this individual who was rebuked by paul in first corinthians chapter 5 he's saying okay he was rebuked now, if he's repented, you ought to love him and forgive him. Okay, um, so that, that's the meaning of that verse there. And then the other two scriptures we looked at about two different individuals in the book of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 20, about Hymenaeus and Alexander, is what Paul is saying is Hymenaeus, the individual, uh, Hymenaeus was the one who was blaspheming or who was spreading or talking of, of spreading false doctrine, right? Uh, and the truth about Jesus. He was saying that the resurrection was already over, causing some, uh, it was causing a lot of confusion and causing a lot of people to walk away from the faith. And and Paul, you know, you see that, okay, accusing him, uh, saying, okay, you're doing this, you're blaspheming, and so I hand you over to the devil, to the Satan. And same thing with Alexander, uh, who seemed to be the one who was accusing uh, who was opposed to Paul uh, in his ministry, was accusing uh, Paul of false things and whatnot. So in both cases, we see that Paul exerts apostolic authority okay, to release these men from the church and dispose them to Satan. It's like, okay, I release you now to the authorities, like the judge saying, right, okay, you've been found guilty, 
I release you now to the authorities. Let them have let them deal with you as they would. Okay, and so knowing the Paul's heart, this would have been done with the intent that uh, um, these men would come into repentance and aligning to the truth. That's the intention behind this thing: is that hoping that they would come into repentance. Uh, but we have no record of the outcome of this case. That is Ahimenius and Alexander, especially. Okay, uh, and so it is true when when we walk in disobedience, in rebellion, and beyond God's limit, one becomes vulnerable to Satan. Okay? When we start walking in ways that we are not, we are not, we uh, in in sinful ways when we are not ought to, uh, we are leaving the gate wide open for Satan to like come, saying, "Please come." Please do whatever you like to do in my life types, uh, you know. So, but as believers, there is uh, there is no need for us to be fearful of being handed over to Satan, as we are pressing into God, uh, not away from God. Right? We are pursuing Him, wanting to know more of Him, and so we need we need not worry about uh, about these things. Okay. Uh, another passage of scripture, uh, which again misses. Which is misunderstood is First uh, Corinthians chapter eleven, verse seventeen and to thirty-four. Uh, we're really not going to read this whole thing, um, but it, it it talks about where you know in people again people in the in the church of Corinth, uh, people were partaking of the Lord's table, uh, and there was and there was no reverence for it. Right, and uh, there was absolutely uh, no reverence for it. So, uh, where it, it says in which verse? Um, where is it? Just give me a second. Yeah, verse 30, uh, or oh, let's read from verse uh, 29 and 30. It says, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Right? For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Okay, so the context here and to what's happening uh, is when, when to what what Paul is writing, saying, okay, for this reason, uh, most many among you are sick uh, or die prematurely, etc., because uh, people partook of the ta of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, right? So it became this communion thing that we talk about. The Lord's table became like some like a feast. Uh, you know, it was like a party time, uh, right? They 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 turned this into a time of having a feast together, like a potluck or whatever, uh, which Paul says they they could do at home. Uh, you can you can do all of this at home, but this but this is not what God the Lord's table is intended for, right? What was intended by the Lord to be a time of great reverence and spiritual proclamation of His death and resurrection uh, was soon returning. It became more like a lunch feast. That's that that's not what this is for, right? And so consequently, instead of enjoying the benefits and blessings and the power of the cross of Christ, on these contrary, these uh, Corinthians by dishonoring the sacred table, uh, they were becoming sick and weak and dying prematurely instead of enjoying the benefits of the cross, uh, which is healing, deliverance, and wholeness and whatnot, right? So. Uh, by blatantly dishonoring what was sacred and making it a time of feasting with no focus or, on examining uh, one's own life, right? That's what we are invited to do, right? When we partake of the communion, we are called to examine our own life. We are called to repent and forgive, uh, you know, and ask for forgiveness as we partake. I, we are not to call to partake of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, right? But we understand that God's dealing of judgment here, and that there's two parts to it, right? When you partake of His table in an unworthy manner, there's a withdrawal of a divine protection, right? It's like His hand, uh, God's hand is taken off of you, 
and then got permitting or engaging these uh, elements such as uh, weakness, sickness, and premature death to get people's attention to bring us back into the right path. And so, again, the point here is we do not have to fear about weak, uh, you know weakness and sicknesses or premature death uh, today because uh, or because of wrongly participating in the Lord's table, uh, simply because we are taught on how to do it correctly and how to do it rightly. Okay, um, and so we don't have to worry about that. But then that's the context behind this passage of scripture. If anyone asks you a question, and this is how you would uh, answer them. Okay, a couple more things uh, quickly here is um, Timothy's uh, stomach uh, problem. In First Timothy chapter five verse twenty three, he says um, Paul is writing to Timothy, saying, "No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake, um, and 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 your frequent infirmities." Okay, um, so it's apparent that Timothy had some stomach problem. Um, you know. Uh, now, whether this was something that started only after coming to Ephesus or whether these problems existed long before, uh, we don't know, uh, right? And so um, maybe he he went on a mission trip, he had something to eat that did not agree with the stomach, something like that. Uh, but uh, we, we don't know the full nature of this, right? But then again, Paul is writing, uh, he recommended the use of wine not to get drunk, uh, but because of its um, medicinal value uh, for Timothy's stomach. Okay, and so with this passage, we can conclude that it is all right to use natural and medical remedies um, while keeping our hearts devoted to God. Okay, um, even when we uh, when we pray and minister healing and deliverance at APC, we say uh, we we emphasize saying. We, th we are thankful for doctors. We, we by any means don't say, okay, you know, God is our healer, so stop taking medicines completely. Uh, that's it's a foolish thing to do, right? And so, while we while we uh, you know um, listen to uh, what the doctors have to say, we continually also encourage our believers to keep our hearts devoted to God. And while we have our hearts devoted to God, uh, you know. Keep uh, continue to take your medical remedies as well, your natural medical remedies, as well. So that is, uh, and that is seen in in Timothy's uh, story, and also in Hezekiah's uh, illness. If you read this whole passage, you'll see, uh, you know, Hezekiah is sick; he has boils in his bodies and whatnot. And God tells, God listens to Hezekiah's prayer, and and through a prophet, he tells, okay, you make a paste out of figs, um, you know, and then put it on those lumps, um, you know. And when he did that, he recovered. Now, King Hezekiah, who was sick, was he was close to death, right? Uh, Hezekiah is healed and he lives another fifteen years uh, because uh, he obeyed, uh, you know, what God what God tells uh, to do through the prophet. Now, again, God could have healed Hezekiah without the use of the paste made from figs. Uh, why he tells the prophet to do so, we don't know. But whether the paste made from figs uh, had any healing or medicinal properties it may have for the boil, we don't know. Uh, but whether it did have medicinal value as well, we don't know. But we can affirm that God is not against the use of natural elements, right? Through which, or uh, you know, his healing is administered. He is not against it. He is willing to use the natural elements as well. Okay, um, and so we got to keep that those things in mind. Um, uh, let's move on to uh, to the next passage. It talks about another character called uh, Trophimus. Now, in First Timothy chapter four, uh, verse twenty, First Timothy chapter four, verse twenty, it says, um, "Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I left in Miletus." sick now we are talking this is apostle paul that we are talking about and he's writing saying you know uh Erastus stayed in corinth but trophimus i left him in in the town called miletus because he was sick now apostle paul was a man you know who ministered in the power of the spirit right who saw mighty healings miracles signs and wonders and uh, whatnot uh, 
and you know he must have prayed for Trophimus, uh, but he was still sick. But the point here is, this didn't stop Paul from going about his ministry. Right? He says, okay, Trophimus is sick uh, in Miletus. I had to leave him there uh, before heading out to Rome. And he said, but Paul continued uh, to minister, to, to go to different cities, uh, to Rome, and, and minister in healing and signs and wonders and whatnot. And so what we can learn from this is we, we do not know, again, what happened to Trophimus after that. We, there's no record of it. Right, so we do not know if this was a temporary sickness or an illness or, or if he recovered quickly after that. But the point here is that we admit that we do not always have all the answers. Okay, which is fine, it's okay. Right, but the point here is that we keep pressing on in the work of the Lord, ministering in the power of the Spirit, just as um, Paul did. Okay, uh, another character uh, that we look at is uh, Ephroditus. Uh, it's a really cool name, isn't it? Ephroditus. Epaphroditus. Okay, for the work. Uh, it, it, it's written here in, in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 25 and 30. Again, Paul writing, it says, verse 27 especially, it says, for indeed he, Epaphroditus, was sick unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Uh, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So the story of this person here, the context here is that Paul was in prison in Rome. And so this individual called Epaphroditus was sent by the church in Philippi to serve uh, Apostle Paul who was in prison. Now he's saying that in serving Apostle Paul, right, uh, he seems to have stretched himself so far that he came close to death, not regarding his own life. Um, and so now, again, we do not know the exact nature of the service, of everything that, uh, how he served Paul and what were those instances, the circumstances that he went through. But what is written is that he came close to death. Uh, you know, he stretched himself quite a bit. And so, um, now just because we are in Christian ministry, okay, uh, serving the Lord and his people and whatnot, we are not automatically guaranteed good health and strength. Okay, it is possible that we can overwork and risk dying in the process. Okay, what? It is possible that we can overwork and risk dying in the process, right? And so, um, while it may seem noble to work till we drop dead for the cause of Christ, this is rather unnecessary and unprofitable because um, we are more useful to God and His kingdom, His people uh, alive. Okay. Um, so that's the story of Epaphroditus. Um, and uh, another classic misunderstanding or misinterpretation is uh, this scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 and 32. Um, is, is sickness the chastening of the Lord? Okay, is sickness the chastening of the Lord? Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32, it says, But when we are judged, we are chastened by the lord but that we may not be condemned with the world so and so what we what uh some of the christians have done it is by saying okay the sickness is the chastening of the lord okay this uh this thing that you're going through is chastening of the lord uh, this disease is the chastening of the lord and so all of these things they attribute it to god as chastening of him but again, remember, when we are interpreting scriptures, we have to interpret it in the light of uh, the rest of the scriptures as well, right? And so let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 to 11. Now, we're not going to read this whole thing. But in that passage, and I would encourage you to read it, Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, it, chastening of God is 
uh, is referred to or um, what do I say? It's 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 shown in relative to uh, relationship to how a father would deal with the son. Okay, so verse seven it says in Hebrews chapter twelve it says if you end your chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Okay, uh, and I mean just think about it is. If I'm going to chasten my son uh, or any father, his son or daughter, you're saying you wouldn't say, okay, be down with this sickness or be down with that sickness or with disease and or whatnot. Right? No. Now, if an earthly father would not do that, how uh, would, a, would a, our heavenly father do something like that to us? And is it right for us to attribute um, a sickness and disease, uh, you know? to God disciplining is very different yes of course we can say that yes and so I mean this uh, disciplining is so much more different from uh, saying okay you know the sickness is for you and this disease is for you right isn't it um, and, and that this whole passage actually let's just read that it's so beautiful in verse 8 in Hebrews 12 it says but if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers uh, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect, right? We correct us. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? Okay, so, um, and, and chastening is the normal course of things uh, which has to do with teaching or correction and uh, you know, punishment done lovingly as to a child. Right, and only in extreme situation has to do with judgment, right? Because uh, the word chasten uh, it comes from the Greek word, which again simply means uh, you know to instruct, to learn, to teach, uh, according to uh, some of the concordance that you can read. Okay, uh, and so in conclusion of uh, of this chapter, uh, you know. We want to just answer one last question and leave with that is that is it all right to combine faith and medicine? Right? Is, is it all right to combine faith and medicine? And the simple answer would be absolutely yes, because uh, we've just uh, we've looked at a couple of instances in the life of King Hezekiah, uh, you know, where fig paste was used, natural medicine, and Timothy, where Paul does take a little wine for his stomach problems and whatnot. And so we believe that there is nothing wrong in combining faith and medicine, right? So when we administer, uh, you know, even when we administer medicine or receive medical help, our eyes are on 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 the Lord, right? He is our healer. We never forget that truth. Okay. Uh, and one last question is: Is taking care of your health a sign of unbelief? Absolutely not. I have one lesson that we can learn from uh, Epaphroditus is that while we do our work in Christian ministry, serving the Lord and his people, we also need to remain responsible and take care of our health. Okay, so stop eating sugar. Just kidding. Okay, all the desserts. Start working out, get some gym subscription, whatever. Okay, uh, right. Uh, while you do everything that you do for his kingdom, uh, you know, take care of your health um, so that you can do what you are doing for a longer period of time. Okay, um, and so that is chapter six, where we try to answer frequently asked questions. Um, these are not the only questions that you might uh, get asked uh, in your time in, in as you minister to people, uh, but just some of the frequently asked questions um, as well. Okay. So that's the end of chapter six. We'll stop here today with this session. We'll continue next week with the rest of the chapters. Okay, um, I'll just stop recording now for a second.